Hey, MMT followers, Christina Fuges with Mole Making Technology, and I am back for another quick MMT chat. My guest today is Rick Seberg, who is an engineering manager for Medline Industries out in Northfield, Illinois. He's also one of Mole Making Technology's newer editorial advisory board members. So hello, Rick. How are you doing, Christine? Not too bad. So to get started, I have to ask you to give a quick snapshot of who Medline is, just in terms of its size, its specialty, so people know who you are, and maybe sure. a little bit about how you wound up there. Okay. Um, well, Medline is one of the largest um, medical supply and distributor companies in the world, and we're actually the largest privately held company. Um, we have, I think, 20 locations worldwide, about 26,000 employees. Wow. And uh, last year, our sales were around $14 billion. So um, we manufacture quite a bit and distribute almost 500,000 different types of uh, medical products. Okay. So um, obviously, with the, the COVID virus, we were heavily involved. We were uh, one of the companies, I don't know if you heard about the project Airbridge. Um, there was four or five medical supply companies that partnered with the government to expedite delivery of PPE from China. Okay. Okay. Um, and uh, we were one of those partners. So. Aha. Well, thank you. Right. Okay. Meaningful work. Yes. Uh, so I said, we do, we don't manufacture everything that we sell and distribute. Um, but uh, we do some uh, rigid plastic, uh, plastic products, which is what uh, we do here in Illinois. Um, so a lot of the single use products of uh, water pitchers, carafts, bed pans, um, some syringe components, uh, sharps containers. Um, so things like that is uh, manufactured here. Okay. Okay. So as engineering manager, why don't you give us a quick day in the life of Rick Seberg? What do you do all day? Uh, my boss asked the same question. Um, <laughs> no. Uh, so the day starts with uh, uh, participating in the production meeting, um, you know, review what happened the day before. Uh, if there's any uh, issues, specifically, obviously, tooling related issues um, that need to be taken care of. Um, review the production schedule, the maintenance schedule. Um, like I said, do some troubleshooting out on the production floor. Um, and then work with the new product, uh, the engineering team here. Um, we're doing a lot of work right now, trying to kind of uh, increase our, um, our capacity on certain product lines. Okay. And also uh, a lot of the current product lines uh, some of the tooling needs to be just replaced, um, it's, you know, reaching its end of life. Yeah. So just uh, doing a lot of work on the front end, uh, you know, changing tooling designs, getting quotes. Um, and we're also trying to get into some different products. So um, working with some product designers, uh, DFMs and okay. uh, things like that on the front end. So got it. Pretty full so day. you name it. Yeah, pretty full day. All right. So obviously you have an extensive background in mold design and engineering and building. You were an injection mold designer first, from what I remember reading. So how do you think that has made you a better tooling engineer? Uh, well, um, that was a good question. And, and actually, as I thought about it, I'm not sure it made me a good tooling engineer. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think being a tooling engineer made me a better mold designer. Okay. But um, I think the the key thing, the the foundation uh, for being a tooling engineer is obviously you have to understand, you know, how an injection mold functions, how it's constructed, um, what are some of the, you know, places where it could go wrong, right. and you know how to address it if it does. So I think that's like the the foundation for being a tooling engineer. Um, so. You know, being a, a hands-on mold designer, I was a mold designer for about seven years in a, a couple of different custom mold building shops, which was also huge, I think, because being in a custom environment, you got exposed to a lot of different hmm. types of products, types of molds, um, versus being maybe in a proprietary or captive environment. All right. True. But, um, so I think it was just laying the foundation of understanding, you know, mold functions and um, you know areas where things could go wrong and and potential corrective actions. 
Okay, so basically fundamentals, but then beyond that, because your experience, you're able to, you've probably had experience with things that maybe others didn't, so you're able to catch things probably, possibly, right? Um, true, uh, it, it definitely helped. Uh, uh, I think one of my strengths in particular is is uh, doing uh, mold design reviews. And uh, anytime I start a new job, I, I really try to beef up our, our mold design review process um, because I think, again, you know, you got to do the work. 80% of the work is done up front. Yep, exactly. So, um, so really having a very thorough mold design review, um, I think, is really um, key to avoiding future problems. I agree. That's critical. It all starts at the beginning, right? Yep. So did you know that you and I have one thing in common about the beginning of our careers in mold making? And, uh -oh. it's, pla and it's Plastec. So Plastec was your first job out of college, right? That's and, correct. And Plastec was really my first job in mold making per se, because Joe Prieschak, who's the owner or the founder of Plastec, um, right. I think he's now the chairman of the board, hired me to launch mold making technology back in the, the late 90s. So he always wanted to get into trade publishing with a magazine dedicated to mold making where mold builders could share experiences and, and grow, you know, share their knowledge. So um, we have that in common, but that's another story. So back <laughs> to you. So tell me a little bit about your first impression of mold making working at Plastec and what did you do there? Well, um, actually my first impression of mold making, I got to go back a little bit farther. So my okay. father and my grandfather were both mold makers. Um, my father ran a small tool and die shop uh, back in Erie called uh, uh, Penn Erie, yeah, which actually okay. wound up getting bought by Yes, <laughs> still so, around today, right? Yeah, um, so so yeah, when I was 10, 12 years old, um, I would spend Saturday mornings at the tool shop with my dad. Um, so I got to learn, you know, at least what an injection mold was and probably learn more about sweeping floors, but... Um, That's okay. <laughs> when I got to Plastec, um, you know, they were just expanding the uh, the mold design department and that's that's where I fit in. Um, I think I was the second or third mold designer that they had hired. Wow. Um, and so you know, obviously getting into it at, at that scale, I think at the time, Plastec was the largest, if not one of the largest, um, you know, tool and die shops in in Erie County. So just the scale, the scope of it was uh, you know pretty impressive, and um, you know, once you obviously get into the, the meat and potatoes of it, um, you know, just understanding the complexity, mm -hmm. understanding the precision uh, involved. Um, you know, at the time, plastic was still doing mostly electrical connector molds for like okay. AMP and Packard Electric and IBM. So, you know, the tolerances that we were talking about, you know, were, you know, microns um, for getting all those laminated inserts. Right. And, so really said the the scale of it um and the precision that's really required um was was kind of eye opening <laughs> i agree i think when i first toured there it was it was a uh, gillette was the customer i think it was yeah, razor they blades yeah. Transitioned yeah. towards the end of my time there they transitioned uh, um joe actually thought you know making electrical connector molds was was too much of a, a pain in the butt because of all the precision and you know all that so he, we, they transitioned into the personal care products yeah which um turned out to be just as difficult for different reasons <laughs> exactly because <laughs> what, what to, about is easy right, right we all have trying their to hold a, an oval deodorant stick oval yeah um, things like that so exactly um so yeah so uh, they were just getting in transitioning into that and yeah uh, gillette was one of the big uh, personal care um, customers. Yeah. So you made a move to product development and packaging solutions right, over at P&G. So why the move? Like what were you and how did your tooling background help you in that role? Well, I, I didn't go to P&G. I, I went to okay. Owens, Illinois in Toledo, okay. Ohio. Um, and P&G was one, was one of their big customers. Got it. Um, so the structure at Owens, Illinois, they had a new product development group and each each team within the new product development group had a dedicated tooling engineer. Okay. So, um, so yeah, I just went on board as one of the tooling engineers for the new product development team. And um, like I said, worked with customers like Procter and Gamble and Cheeseboro Ponds and 
nice. um, a lot of other big packaging companies to um, to work on you know the new product design and tooling development obviously to launch those products so so you were getting we talked about a little bit earlier about you and your mold design reviews is getting stuff more up front so i don't think you can get much more up front than having a tooling engineer at the table during product development correct exactly that was yeah. that was one of the key uh, key elements was getting it so uh, owens illinois did a lot of in-house product design for the customers in addition to obviously some of the customers having their own product design um, but yeah it was uh, very critical that we were at the table right right at the beginning yeah. working you know literally table to table with the product designers and um, helping them understand you know the requirements for um, for you know making that part that they're trying to to design and conceptualize yeah what about maintenance because you talked about that too so that tying all your knowledge into the maintenance of that mold and how that impacts the customer right so um, that was something that came about again as my earlier converse comment that you know being a, a good tooling engineer made me a better part uh, mold designer because once I did get into the you know tooling engineer aspect of it um, you know and e again even going back to plastic one of the really key things at plastic was they were building tools and they had a production floor yes so the molds that we built you know they were being run in the room right next door so you got to see you know the impact of your tool design and oh yeah I, that was a great design for manufacturing of the mold but now when the guys have to tear it apart to clean it yeah. it really adds to the you know difficulty of, of maintenance yeah. so what are the key things when you're designing the mold that make it easier to disassemble make it safer to disassemble that was a really big one uh, mm -hmm. a big lesson to learn was you know, uh, making the tool uh, easier and safer to handle for for the guys on the bench. So, um, so yeah, I think you know, as as my experience grew, just understanding you know how the tool is handled, how it's run, how it's set in the press, um, all those things you know really contributed to um, making better mold designs. Absolutely. So it's all that exposure. And, and I guess at nowadays we call that that tribal knowledge, right? We're a new generation coming. You have all this experience. And a lot of it's just in here from stuff that you've mistakes that have been made, things that you've noticed, like you're just saying, to, to re-engineer something to avoid mistakes in the future. That is something that will be missed, right? right? For a new generation coming in without that longevity of experience and seeing things and seeing mistakes. Right. Yep. And you know, I know I'm biased because of my my gray hair, but <laughs> you know, nowadays when I started mold design, we were still doing pencil and paper. <laughs> um, uh, what's that? <laughs> yeah, you know, now with the the, the CAD and the 3D technology, you know, I mean, I hate to say it, but like you you're really not thinking as much, in yeah. my opinion. You know, like you can pull up solid works and it'll tell you where the split line should be and where the draft should be. And, yeah. you know, and um, so I, sometimes I think that you don't, and even when I was on the board, you know, we had, you know, a six foot drafting table and you had the whole mold design laid out in front of you and on CAD, now you're just working on a, you know, 20 inch monitor. Right. Like you have to zoom in on an area. Like sometimes you lose sight of the whole mold. Yes. And, um, so again, I just feel like the CAD has made it almost too easy uh, for people to really think about, you know, yeah. the whole mold and, and everything. So um, it's yeah. that catch 22, because if you look at that argument, right, well, we need to go that way because people aren't coming in. So stuff needs to automatically be thinking. But yeah. then you right, you lose all that all that organic fundamental knowledge, which I we're going to talk to in a little bit because I think it ties in nicely to that whole education end. So then you moved on to HP. We're doing some work for them on an ink cartridge. You want to talk about that a little bit and any lessons from that experience? Yeah, that was actually one of the highlights of my, my uh, career. So I was with Owens, Illinois again, and uh, Hewlett Packard was looking for a, a partner to develop a new inkjet cartridge. Um, most of their inkjet cartridges, even to this day, are still made out of engineering grade resins because okay. of the interaction with the ink. And at the time, I don't think I'm giving away any secrets now, <laughs> but um, so when HP first started making inkjet cartridges, um, the, 
the printer head was in the inkjet cartridge. Okay. So every time you bought an inkjet cartridge, you were buying a new printer head. Wow. But obviously, because it was a throwaway item, the ink, the printing quality was poor. Okay. So then they made new printers where they put the printer head in the machine uh -huh. so to make the inkjet cartridges cheaper. And uh, so they, they did that. And then they wanted to, the idea was that, you know, instead of a $40 inkjet cartridge, they wanted to make inkjet cartridges $5. Okay. So that people would buy more because they actually made more money on the ink than the actual printer. And Wow. So that's always the to, way, right? Consumables. <laughs> right. So they came to Owens, Illinois, because OI, obviously, with uh, experience doing, you know, caps and closures and high volume manufacturing, um, they wanted a partner with a high volume manufacturer who did commodity resins. Okay. Um, so they came to us to make this new inkjet cartridge out of, you know, polypropylene, polyethylene materials. It would be low cost, high volume. And, uh, you know, we, we built a new manufacturing facility um, and developed this cartridge with them. And it was the first time that Hewlett Packard had gone outside of the company to design a new product. Oh, wow. So it was very interesting. Um, we had a lot of challenges, which could take a whole other uh, show. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think one of the biggest things I learned at that time was so HP had their culture and their way of doing things. In Owens, Illinois, we had our culture and our way of doing things. And when the project kicked off, we really struggled because mm -hmm. they had their way of doing it and their expectations. We had our way of doing it. And like we, we just were butting heads in the very wow. beginning. People. So we actually, like we literally took a timeout. We said, okay, timeout. We spent like two weeks and we just got around a table and we, we hashed out a new process for the new product development of this particular product. And, you know, just really accentuated to me the importance of, you know, of having good processes, of having, you know, a, a way of doing things, of documentation, yes. um, just having that map um, and, and following it. So... Once we got that ironed out and everybody understood what the expectations were and how we were going to execute it, um, I mean, it, the project really just took off. So it just really ex accentuated the kind of the soft side of things and project yes. management. Well, and, and communication, right? Right. Yeah. Um, so that was, it was a great project to work on. It really was one of the, like I, said, I look back, that's like one of the highlights of my yeah. career. But, that's um, well because there's a lot of firsts there that's exciting right and who oh, can't relate to that everybody uses those today so that's kind of that is yeah. exciting so all right so all right so then you fast forward and you're working at medline so when mm -hmm. you want to talk a little bit how did you end up here where you're looking for a specific opportunity in your career or how did you end yeah talk about that yeah um i've i kind of have been in and out of the medical product medical device um industry a couple of other times in my past and um, it's just, it's an arena that I enjoy working in because of, again, you know, you're working on critical kinds yeah. of products. Um, just the, the, the nature of the work, the criticality of it. Um, I'm kind of, you know, kind of, again, process oriented. And um, so I, I wasn't looking for an opportunity, but, but one, you know, came up in front of me again, where, it was getting back into the kind of the medical products, um, you know, industry. And it touched on all the things that I like in my career, which is, you know, new tooling design and development, um, a little bit of product development. We don't do a lot here, but we're, you know, hopefully getting into more um, mold maintenance practices. Mm -hmm. I actually oversee the maintenance department for tooling. Um, so it just touched on all the areas of my career that um i got it's the like most it's all coming together right yeah. all coming together that's got that's awesome all right so let's talk education for a bit so you attended penn state um university the Berlin, right college studying mechanical yeah, college. engineering yeah. yep yeah. and operations management so you know 
going back to what we talked about earlier, like lately, especially during this year, 2020, I've been hearing a lot and having a lot of conversations about education and training. Well, you know, the lack thereof, especially when it comes to fundamental mold design and engineering. So first, do you agree with that? And then, you know, if you do or if you don't, like, do you have any advice for anyone interested in entering the world of mold making in terms of getting a good solid education? Um, definitely. Uh, so I unfortunately attended Barron College before the plastics program got established ah, there. That's funny. Um, so I, I wish I, I would have had the opportunity to go through that uh, program at that time. But um, even just, you know, kind of dabbling in and out, I've taken some, you know, like continuing education um, classes and seminars and things. Um, and I agree that like anytime mold design comes up in yeah. particular, um, yeah, they just kind of skim the surface, right? Because if you really, the more time that you spend in it, I think you really understand the complexity of it. I mean, you could talk about, you know, material selection, um, right. you know, metallurgy, um, heat treating, you know, strength of materials. Um, I think one that's really overlooked is just understanding cooling. You know, and yes. Calculate the uh, thermal expansion and heat transfer, and um, I think you know mold flow analysis is a, is a whole other thing that you could spend a lot of time on. So, so I do think that um, there is a big demand, especially on the on the mold design side, for an in depth uh, training program. Um, even when I started at Plastec, I got out and again didn't really you know know anything about mold design per se and uh there was a small college in in the erie area at the time called alliance college okay um, which unfortunately is not around anymore but they had a a uh, one semester of injection mold design taught by one of the local designers and uh and even just taking that because i think one of the other key things in whether it's mold design even or mold making uh, if you go to a tool shop and even to say if you're a mold maker and you get into their apprentice program, um, you're going to learn how to build a mold or how to design a mold the way that company yeah. builds them or designs them, right? They're all geared towards their specialties, what equipment they have, um, you know, just their experiences. And I think if you had a more formalized, you know, education program, where you can really get exposed to the best practices of the industry versus just what that particular shop does, yes. um, I think would be you know critical. So, so I do think if you can find any kind of formal education, definitely you know jump on that. Um, and then I my other thing is I wish I would have done it a long time ago is um, you know don't be afraid to to take a processing class, you know, go to RJG or, or whoever, or, you know, just look outside of just the machining aspect of it or the, you know, the 3D modeling aspect of it. Right. Really expose yourself because, again, just in my biased thinking, you know, the injection mold is the heart and soul of any product or project that, right, you can, you can yeah. have, you know, just a generic molding machine but you can't make whatever product you're making without that specific mold that makes that specific product. Exactly. So it's really, to me, it's really the heart of, of anything that you're making uh, when you're talking about injection molding. And there are so many things that touch on that, like I said, the processing, the equipment. Uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, if, if anybody was starting, I would say, don't just focus on the machining, don't just focus on the design, learn about processing, learn about resin. Yeah. Uh, you know, all, all of that get as well rounded as you can. It's funny that you mentioned that because when Gardner um, acquired mold making uh, and brought it into the, its family of magazines, which Gardner Business Media is known for modern machine shop production, the metal cutting side of manufacturing, and they have plastics magazines too. So mold making, just like you're saying, it is clearly right down the middle. You have to know the metalworking side of a mold and you have to know the plastic side or the processing side. And that's to me is what makes it so unique that well-rounded nature, you have to know, you'll build a better mold and get a better product if you understand where that mold ends up, right? And what you're making. But right. I don't know that it happens a lot. That's why I'm always intrigued by the mold builders that also mold, 
and like even beyond sampling that are getting into molding too. I, I believe they must learn so much more seeing where their product ends up. Oh, yeah, and absolutely. how it right and how it acts and how it's maintained. So yeah, I agree with you on that. Do you have any advice for? So say there's people that are employed, right? Like continuing education. So to shop leadership nowadays, how? Because during COVID too, I've heard a lot that people on the floor have had to cross train. They they had they've had to put people where they need them. So there's this spotlight on, whoa, our people aren't as cross trained as these need to be. So do you have any advice for how to do that when it comes to mold design and engineering? Yeah. Um, well, again, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> when I started my career at Plastec, um, like I said, I think I was the second, uh, I think I was the second designer that they hired. Um, and literally the engineering department, the drafting department hadn't even been built yet. That's crazy. So they were still adding the design room to the, to the building. So I spent six months uh, on the floor doing mold maintenance, um, you know, running a lathe, um, you know, roughing out uh, components, you know. Yeah. Um, so again, I agree with you with the the cross training, um, just to just to get an understanding of, um, you know, not just the mold, you know, building part of it, but again, like you said, uh, it was a great opportunity because plastic was doing molding right in the room next door. Yeah. So you could go out and just see, you know, how the machine is running, how the mold is running what issues they're having when they're, you know, starting up a mold or whatever. So, um, so definitely that, that cross training, like I said, is, is critical. And uh, the other part of it, I think is just that, again, when, you know, I feel, I feel like a dinosaur right now. But, but you don't you know, look when, like When one. I first got into <laughs> plastics or and mold making, you know, you had mold makers who could run every machine in the, in the room, you know, they could, they could assemble and they could, you know, bench a tool and they could do everything. And, and over time, it's gone to a specialty uh, yeah. situation where this guy runs the CNC, this guy runs the EDM, you know, and I think you're getting less and less of that all, all yes. around uh, mold maker. It's departmentalized, yeah. right? Yeah. So I think, uh, I think, yeah, if you can get more of those, those, you know, kind of top, top shelf, you know, mold makers who can run the whole thing. Um, I think that that makes you just a better, better, better uh, uh, employee and, and better contributor for sure. Yeah. It also, to me, would be more like to that, when I think about the next generation, it exposes that if you're, if you are going into a career that's more well-rounded, there's more opportunities for you. Right. right. Once you get in there, you're not pigeonholed. You're the CNC guy. If you know everything, maybe there's just other growth patterns that you can take within the same company even. So right. yeah, cross training is huge. All right. right. So outside of work, and this is kind of tied into education too, is all this industry involvement, right? Networking, belonging to associations. So you've been active in SPE. And now mm -hmm. I'm not familiar with this. I'm assuming it's like Antec. So it's the Retech Conference. Is that what it's mm -hmm. called? How you say it? So yep. what is that? And how were you involved in that? And what 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 are is that something that's still around that people should um, be involved in or attend? You know, that's a good question. I, I haven't seen one advertised in a while. Yeah. Um, but yeah, back in the what late eighties, uh, I was involved in the the um, Erie SPE chapter. Um, and I was on, I got onto the board. And so our retech is a regional technical conference. Oh, you know, okay. Duh. National technical yes. conference. Okay. So it's just a smaller scale. It was like a two or three day conference. Um, and again, you're just focusing on, so like for Pennsylvania, we were drawing people from, you know, like New York, Ohio. Um, actually, we went up to Toronto to pull some people in. But okay. yeah, it's just a much smaller scale. Um, um, it was great opportunity because Erie, you know, was a huge, you know, market for injection molding and tool making. Um, so they were always big events for us. You know, I right. mean, we, had, we had a couple hundred people in attendance for a little, little conference. Um, so yeah, so I, I got to organize that with the uh, with the local chapter, and um, I actually still have the book that you know we we handed out. <laughs> And I was looking at it the other day and, and uh, it's just funny how it was, I think it was 1990 when we had the retech. Okay. And uh, it was, you know, looking forward, what's the future, wow. um, you know, uh, of mold making. 
And uh, I mean, just some of the things we were talking about was, it was like looking at a sci-fi movie from the 50s compared to where oh we were. Oh my gosh, I would love for you to share, you should share that with me. That's so interesting, sure, right? I'll yeah. look back at what you thought was going to be coming. Oh my gosh, I would love to you to share that, Rick. That's a yeah, riot. Absolutely. I send you that. So, but yeah, so it was just like, here's where we think things are going. And yeah. we were talking, we talked a little bit. There was one, one guy came in, talked a little bit about, you know, artificial intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, I mean, again, just, you know, it, just compared to where we actually are versus yeah. what we were talking about is, it's quite different. <laughs> it is quite different. That's a riot. So do you, I would think, uh, I know you don't know the answer to this, but um, those regional conferences would be really good right now. This year with all this lack of trade shows and conferences, anything virtual, I mean, there's plenty of that going on, but I would assume SPE, who's all about technical education, would probably be doing something like that. Or right. they should be, the local chapters should be, because you got to start local, right? Right. Got to grow your own. So I will actually, I'll include a link to that. Um, was it a specific division of SPE that you were involved with? Were you, or was it just oh, national? Well, we were the local, you know, chapter. And um, I, again, I, I forget, but like, obviously there's like the mold making division. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, we were, molding, we were just yeah. the, the general um, okay. you know, uh, SPE chapter, but because of, it was eerie, it was, you know, tool making and, and processing. Yeah, got it. Awesome. All right. Well, hey, anything else you want to share about your journey? Any any tips or anything out there? I think it was a great conversation. Enlightened us a little bit on where you who you are and where you've come from and what you've learned. Yeah. No. I um. I thanks for the opportunity. This was this was very very Not so exciting. bad, right? Um. And like I said, I think we've touched on it, but I think just the the most important thing I can say is, um, you know, just expose yourself to as many opportunities uh, as possible. Like I said, just if you're a mold maker, you know, look into processing, look into materials, look into, you know, look into all the other areas that touch, you know, touch the mold, because I think that just make you a better, you know, person, better mold maker, and um, it just opens up a lot of opportunities. I agree. Well said. All right. Well, Rick, thank you for your time today. And for everybody out there listening, uh, go to moldmakingtechnology.com for everything moldmaking. Stay healthy, stay informed, and stay inspired.